of joy as the morning wakes we your children give you praise you are magnificent eternally you are wonderful glorious Jesus no one ever will compare you are magnificent eternally you are one And no one ever will compare to you, Jesus. No one ever will compare to you, Jesus. Wonderful Abba, oh, we love you this morning. It's so good to be in your house, good to be in your presence. It's good to be in your house, good to be in your presence. It's good to be in your One more minute and just love on Jesus. We love your name. We love your name. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you. Good morning. Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is good to be together. I really enjoy that extra hour of sleep and so we're ready to, to get up and worship. If you're joining us from home, we're so glad that you're here and we want to remind you that it is Communion Sunday. So get your, your juice and your bread ready and we'll be celebrating Communion after uh, the sermon today. So wonderful time to be together. We're starting a new sermon series today called All About Jesus. And we are focusing today on why Jesus was born. So we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and find that in the Blue Bibles among you, I encourage you to do that. And hear our call to worship this morning from the 8th Psalm. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's stand and worship our God. Lion of Judah, roaring with power and fighting our battles, every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of He's coming, he's coming on the 
Uh, be sure to fill out your connection card. It's the button above the live stream. And if you're here in First Hall, we encourage you to take that um, connection card that's connected to your bulletin, fill it out. There's an opportunity to share your prayer requests. On the back, if you check confidential, only Jim Wood and I will see those. Otherwise, our um, elders and deacons and prayer ministers will pray over these prayer requests within the next 48 hours. It's a great privilege for us to walk with you through through suffering and also to rejoice with you in joy. Um, also want to remind you about in-person um, in giving. We'll be passing a basket later on in the service. So if you have a cash offering, there are envelopes on the chair backs so you can use that to put your cash in and write your name on it because we want to acknowledge your generosity. If you're online, there's a button above the live feed or you can use text to give and that number is 5 
three. So um, you type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, and send the text, and then it will walk you through the giving process. We want to r- remind you about the awesome things that are happening at First Presbyterian Church. They're on the bulletin, so there's an online bulletin, and then, of course, you have bulletins in your hands here in First Hall. Please look over all those announcements. There's a prayer training coming up and lots of other great stuff. Want you want to remind you about our Thanksgiving baskets. This is a great opportunity to share with um, the, those that are in need this season. So if you look at the bag, you will see that there's a devotional. We'd love for you to use the devotional as you go shopping. And then the shopping list is on the back. The baskets are due in next week. So please, um, if you didn't bring yours in today, bring that in next week. Also, we are looking for help to purchase the turkeys that will go with these baskets. And so we need $5,000 for 200 baskets. So please, if you would like to be generous in that way, you can use the kiosk or online giving to do that as well. I want to remind you as well that we've got an awesome masterclass coming up on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. It's Vincent Van Gogh, A Portrait of the Compassionate Life. It's with Cheryl Wood and me, more Cheryl than me. So it's going to be awesome. And um, the the link to the website, uh, to the class, the Zoom link is online. So please be a part of that. And I think we're going to hear from our children next. So we're excited to hear them sing. All kiddos, if you'll come up now for the children's sermon and if you'll come stand on the steps, all sweet kiddos. You guys ready? Okay. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me who then shall I the light and I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes I'm here on the earth and I'm feeling no Oh, 
Yes, I can see a light that is coming. so good. Now, if y'all want to come sit with me and the rest of you kiddos can um, come up and sit with me for the children's sermon. Come on, come take a seat. Good job. You did an excellent job singing and doing all the music and the hand motions and everything. And you did it with a mermaid. That was so good. That was so good. So good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you? Is everybody doing well? Come on over, Grayson. I can't hear you from over here. All right, so last Sunday was trick-or-treating day, right? So last Sunday was October, and now what month are we in? November. November. And listen, so good morning, Got Kids it's, and, and Tasso kiddos. It's good to see you. Come on, Virginia. Come on up and sit with us. So listen, so you all went trick-or-treating or pass out candy or did something fun, and then Monday happened, and Monday was the first day of November, Okay. And you know what happened to me on Monday? You're never gonna believe this, it was ridiculous. November 1st, I walked into my office in the preschool and you know what was in there? You, you'll never guess, a Christmas tree. And that was so ridiculous. And my two coworkers said, we have outvoted you. If you um, don't wanna work with a Christmas tree, you have somewhere else you can work. We are gonna celebrate Christmas. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous because in my family, you don't start to celebrate Christmas until after what holiday? Thanksgiving people, that's what everybody should do. You celebrate Christmas after Thanksgiving. And I love Thanksgiving because for me, Thanksgiving is a holiday that's about being thankful, but it's about being with family. So I can't stand the fact that Christmas is now eating up Thanksgiving and now Thanksgiving doesn't exist because there's a Christmas tree in my office and I'm so, yeah, there's probably a turkey in there too and they just don't go together. They don't go together at all. And so I started thinking about Thanksgiving and I, and I started thinking about why I love it and it's because I love family. And so I started thinking about family and all the different kinds of family. And there's some families that are like my family where we only have one kid, so there's only three of us. And there's some families um, like the Crumley family where they have lots of children so it feels really joyful to be at their house, I'm sure. And then there are families where there's some families where there's only one mom and there's some families where there's only one dad and there's some families where um, the moms carry the babies in their bellies and then there are some families where listen to this this is so special where the kids actually get to be picked out and do you know what that means when you get to be picked out and you weren't grown in your in your mom's belly that means that you're so special that your parents got to pick you out and that means that you're adopted. And so today we're gonna to talk about being adopted into God's family and what that means today. And so Jim's scripture, he's gonna be talking from the book of John and he's talking about the word becoming flesh. And that's really fancy words for Jesus coming to save us and he comes and he becomes a what? Um, he, comes, he goes from heaven and he comes down and he's born and he comes what? He becomes a man and he lives among us, right? Okay, so I start thinking about what it means to become flesh and all the choices. And I start thinking about um, the three R's of Jesus. 
And Arlie was at the Triple R Ranch yesterday with her confirmation class. And so I started thinking about what those three R's are. And there are some people, Jesus came to those who, who, um, who he came for and they rejected him. So he came for the Jews and the Jews did not believe, right? So they rejected him. So you can either reject Jesus or you can receive Jesus, which means that you believe Jesus died on the sins, died on the cross for your sins, and you, you can accept him into your heart, which is we, what we choose to do as Christians, right? Or, and number three, the third R, is that we can reflect Jesus. Reflect Jesus. So when we accept Jesus into our heart, right? we can choose to shine the love of Jesus and his glory and share it through our words and our actions and all of those other things. So that's what it means when Jesus said he was gonna come, send his son to become, become flesh among us, who's gonna become a person so he could die on the cross for our sins. And then we get to choose to be adopted into God's family. So that is the most special kind of family that you could ever become part of because you weren't just born of him, he chose you, which is the absolute most special kind of family. So I'm gonna close this in prayer and we are gonna go to children's church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be in the most special family that you could ever have, which is an adopted family of Christ, Lord, and that you loved us so much that you picked us to be in your family. And we are so thankful for that. And we thank you that you sent your son down on earth to die on the cross for our sins so that we could be part of your family. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, let's go to Children's Church, kiddos. Good stuff. Oh, morning, church. So we're, we're going to do a six-week series on, on Jesus. And um, I, I always say this, not, not just me. I mean, it's really, you know, if, you, if you get Jesus right, you get really everything else right. But if you get Jesus wrong, <clears throat> you really get almost everything else wrong. And so I, I want to spend some, some time asking some questions about Jesus. Why was he born? Why did he die? How did he live? Why is he coming again? These, these basic questions that are, that are often not asked and even more seldom answered. And so today the question is, why was he born? Now there's 2,000 years of, of theological tradition that will give us all kinds of tomes and tomes and tomes about why he was born. I wanna to try to get to what I believe is the absolute most basic. And then I'll leave it to you to build off of that. And it begins by, by really saying that there are, there are three versions of God. So there's a great book. I'm going to be doing a, a class after this for three weeks on the Trinity. And um, I came across this book by Michael Reeves called Delighting in the Trinity, an Introduction to the Christian Faith. It says it's an introduction, but it is absolutely just great. I mean, for all of us. Um, and, and, and one of the things that Reeves says is that there are really three <clears throat> versions of God, okay? Three versions of God. The first version of God is God as a creator. So God created everything, right? So the creator God. That's kind of the idea of deism, right? You don't have to believe in Christianity. You don't have to believe in, you know, it's just there's a creator, creator God. The, the second is that there's the ruler God, the God who sets the rules and, and we, we follow the rules, sort of the, the rule maker, or we might say the, the law giver. And, and the, the third, I'll, I'll come to in a moment, but let, let's just look at the, at the first two. The idea of a creator God. Well, let me back up. Maybe this is easier to ask. The answer to these questions really come out of a, another question that we could ask. What was God doing before creation? Seemed like an interesting question, right? What was God doing before creation? So let's just answer it with those first two. If God was a creator God, God wasn't doing anything before creation because the definition of God is a creator. So God needs a creation. So God wasn't God until God made something and was a creation. Now, if you, if you, if you dig into that, and I know this is kind of in our minds, but this is really, really interesting and important stuff. 
then that means that if God is primarily or solely the creator, <clears throat> that means that God needs the creation to be God. Okay? So, so, so then that God is not really all powerful or all, is that God has a need for creation. Or, or if, we look at, if we look at God as the ruler, ruling over what? Is it as if just God was kind of placed in to be the moral authority for us, kind of like a traffic cop? And if, and, if we, and if we think about God as kind of the traffic cop, which many, many people do, right? I mean, it's, here's the rules, you've got to follow the rules, here's the rules, you've got to follow the rules. It gets even more interesting because if God's God, and let's say God did create, and God's a ruler, and he's the traffic cop, then, then God kind of makes, it'd be like being pulled over by the traffic cop, and, and, and the traffic cop, she's deciding what the rules are as she's talking to you, Right? Either that or, or the rules are independent of the traffic cop. So it gets kind of, kind of weird when you think about that. But, but here's another way to look at it. And it comes throughout the scriptures. And I'm going to be in two particular texts today. I'm going to be in the first few chapters of Genesis, and I'm going to be in the first chapter of John. But I want to start in the first chapter of John. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up. We're going to read the first 14 verses. <clears throat> now, I will tell you that you will see very, very quickly that John is absolutely telling the story of creation again. He's telling the Genesis story. He even uses it by saying, in the beginning, the same way that the beginning of Genesis begins. We'll get to back to Genesis in a moment. <clears throat> so, so listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him... Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to, to God. Now, I want to go to Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And then if you keep reading the next 20 or so verses, you'll see God said, God said, God said. John begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But, but I want to I do something kind of interesting here. So go down to verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1. This is the sixth day of creation. Then God said... God's made everything else, right? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish, the birds, the livestock, the wild animals, everything that moves along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And let me ask you this question. When God says, let us, who's he talking to? Now, many people, including some theologians, say that's the monarchical plural. Simply that, like the queen says this, um, the queen is so monarchical, right, that when she speaks, she speaks in the plural. She, she, if she's going to the bathroom, she says, we shall go, we, we. No, we shall go, we. we I mean, we shall go to the bathroom, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> we, I mean, so, so many people say it's the monarchical plural. It just, it just shows the majesty towards God. But, oh, let's keep going. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You see what just happened? 
The definition of being created in the image of God is to be in relationship. He didn't create the man. He didn't create the woman. He created them together in his own image. And so this really, really interesting, and I know we're in our head, but this is absolutely critical because I will promise you, you cannot know what love is if you don't wrap your head around this. This idea is that that when we are created in the image of God, we are created in relationship because God was a relationship. Now, that sounds weird, but go back to John. And when you go back to John chapter 1, look at verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's Jesus. We've only seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Look at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. What you come to realize is that what was God doing before creation? God was being a Father. And God was being a Son. And God was being the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to talk about the Father and Son today. We'll get to the Holy Spirit in another day in a beautiful way. There's a mutuality. There's a relationship that existed before God created the world. Now, that that means you're like, oh, man, Jim's just all over me right now. I mean, it's all up in here. But here's the thing. That relationship between the Father and the Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in John 3, 16, that relationship between the Father and the Son eternally before the created world means this. It means that, it means that God, created, God, God created everything not out of need because God was already complete in relationship. Why did, he, why did he create? Because the love was so great between the Father and the Son that it just overflowed. And making something out of that just made, it was just, it just was beautiful. It was just an outpouring of God's love. And so what what pre-existed creation was not simply the father and the son in a relationship, but what what pre-existed creation is love. Love can't be made. It can only be shared. And so this world is, is, is a result of, of God's overwhelming love, the, the, the love between the Father and the Son, the lover and the beloved. The Son's love for the Father is so overwhelming that it just, it just pours out. That's what John is saying. And when you read the Gospel of John all the way through, you'll see this. This, this love overflowing means that, that God created a good world. Every day when he made it, the first five days, he says, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then on the sixth day, when God made us, he said it was very good. Because finally, God had made something in his own image. And he says, be fruitful and multiply to us. Be creative. Take this love that I made in you, the image that I have of you in love, and let it just outflow. Be fruitful, be multiply. Have, have, have dominion, not, not dominion in control, but, but share this love. That's what it is to be made in the image of God. Now, not, not like some plastic doll bearing some faint, fictile resemblance to some mythic thing. But instead, he desired that we be pulled up into that very eternal triune love. When, when, God, when God made us, God, God, God didn't want us to stay here. God wanted to pull us up here in, into that relationship of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And that's how it was. When you read Genesis in the first chapters, you start to realize that in the cool of the day, the King James says, when when God would take his walk, he'd walk along with Adam and Eve. They were in relationship. They were sharing this love. It was just beautiful. And then came the original problem. Sometimes we call it original sin. The word sin doesn't show up for another chapter, but the original problem is this, is that we stopped up this love that God had for us because we turned inward. And here's how we turned inward. It was the garden woman. She's not named Eve yet. She's named Eve so that Adam can have control over her. That's, that's sin. Now, she's just, he's just the man and the woman. And Milton in Paradise Lost does a beautiful job at this. Milton surmises that what happens is that one day she's walking along and she sees a, a placid pool so, so calm 
that she looks and she sees something. It's a reflection. The trees overhead. Everything she'd seen except something she's never seen. Her own face. And over time, she sees and she stares in the face over and over and over. So that what starts to happen is there's a self-love. She's no longer seeing herself being made in the image of God that she sees walking and giving and loving. She sees herself. And what she does is she's reflective. This is an analogy, right, for all of us. She's reflective of this love now is turned inward. And then she's naked and ashamed. And then when she's thinking about herself and it's turned inward, and as the man is reflecting on himself and it's inward, they're afraid of each other, they're afraid of others. So Jesus was born to unbend us. He was born to remind us to draw back some faint memory, but memory of truth and love, that love is interpersonal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to to show us that that love, love can't be made, it can only be shared. We cannot love ourselves as a reflection in a placid pool, that's narcissism. But instead we love each other by seeing the image of God in one and the other and knowing that in some way if I see it in you, you see it in me. And when that happens, we're no longer naked and ashamed. We're we're, we're no longer hiding. We're no longer in self-preservation. We're no longer bent. This is why the Son was born. This is why Jesus was born, was to unbend us. And so God comes not as a creator or a ruler, but now God comes as a Father, sending Himself, His own Son, begotten, not made, you see, a father is not a father if he doesn't have a son. A son is not a son if he doesn't have a father. They... And he lifts us up, this son of God, into the Godhead of love. We were, um, <clears throat> Cheryl and I had, um, had a visitor at our bedroom door a couple of days ago, Gideon, two and a half year old grandson. Um, and uh, and he's knocking on the door, making sure we're awake. And, um, and he comes in, and so I grab him, pick him up, and just kind of throw him on the bed. And, um, and uh, I start kissing on his head, and Cheryl comes up, and she grabs his feet, and she just starts kissing all over his feet. And he's just laughing and giggling and being, you know, it's like, oh, no. And then all of a sudden, he stops, and he, he, in between kind of the laughter, he says, are you playing with me? And, and there was a beautiful, sweet sadness or sad sweetness to that for me. Because he's at that stage and he's in a room of safety and security where there's no guile. There's no need to protect himself. There's just a simple desire to put words to a feeling of security and love. Are you playing with me? No wonder, Jesus says, unless you're like one of these little children. You can't come to the kingdom. So God gives us this word. The words that this little boy is trying to place on on love and security. God gives the world this word by becoming like us. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that is made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. He gives us this by becoming like us. I've been thinking about this word kind. You know, we say, are you kind? Are, are you a kind person? And usually we're talking about, are you good, sweet, do you share your toys, you know, that kind of stuff. But you can also say three of a kind or four of a kind, right? You know, they're the same thing. <clears throat> Here's the theological root of the word kindness. It's to see the family resemblance in each other. It's, it's to be kind is to see the love and, 
and the beauty in each other as if we are of the same family. It's to see the family resemblance just as I see it as I'm kissing on a little boy's head. Not a family resemblance of genetics, but a family resemblance of this, of this love and this joy and, this, and this, this fully human man, Jesus, and this fully God son who, who've come together to share a kindness, to say, no longer do you have to only think that you have to protect yourself or those that you know look like you, but, but now, you can, now you can be kind knowing that you're all of the same family. Jesus was born to restore the memory of being in the image of God. We experience this, this imaging love, John says, like light that emanates. It's so powerful and beautiful for all the world to see. Jesus was born not to reconcile us with God. Jesus was born to reconcile us with God as we are reconciled with each other to see the kindness, the same family in each other. That's what this little two and a half year old is, is experiencing without even knowing it. There's something within him, there's something within every single person that's born that, that is of a memory that goes, goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, far beyond his birth and far beyond any family lineage can be traced of what it was to walk in the garden naked and unashamed, with no guile, no need to protect ourselves. And that's what we're all craving in our lives. There's a a scene of a movie that is probably one of the scenes that I think about more than any other movie. It's a movie called Blood Diamonds. It's about the slavery and the diamond trade in Sierra Leone. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, I think, is in it. There's a father, an African father, whose son is taken in a raid by the rebels. And immediately, a boy this tall is taught to hold a gun through drugs and mental manipulation. He's taught to be a killer, as all child soldiers are. You know that AK-47s have actually been resized to hold a child so a child can hold them. And, and, and the father spends his life seeking his son, looking, looking, searching, searching, searching. And all these things happen, but at the end of the movie, lo and behold, the father that has been seeking and searching his son finds him. He finds his son with a gun in his hand pointed at someone that he has been trained to believe is the enemy ready to execute them. And the father, Solomon Van D, says, Dia, the boy's name, Dia. He calls his name, Dia. What are you doing? Dia, look at me. And he slowly starts to move and position himself. Look at me between the soon-to-be victim and the boy, you are Dia Vende of the proud Mende tribe. You are a good boy who loves soccer and school. Your mother loves you so much. She waits by the fire making plantains and red palm oil stew with your sister Nyanda and the new baby. The cows wait for you. And Babu, the wild dog who minds no one but you. I know that they made you do bad things, but you're not a bad boy. I am your father who loves you, and you will come home with me and be my son again. I know they made you do bad things, but you are not a bad boy. I am your father who loves you, and you will come home with me and be my son again. So great is the Father's love that he sent his Son to remind us, to draw within us this faint memory that all of us have been born with, and yet 
Over time, guile and need for protection has caused to grow more faint and more dim and more faint and more dim to remind us that He loves us and that you are not a bad girl. You are not a bad boy. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I have come to take you to be with me. So what does this mean for us? Jesus being born means this. It means that God's love is now ever present. It's real and it's accessible. When Jesus says you can pray like this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he means that. He's saying you don't have to wait for that love. You can experience it now. Thy kingdom come here. Thy will be done here on earth as it already is in heaven. This love is ever present. It's not some aspirational wish of what it is to die and get there. But it's here. Jesus being born means that God's love is to love the other. You know, the only definition of being in the image of God is this, to be male and female. It it just says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. The, the The only image of God is to see the other in each other. I don't know if I'm like all men, but I'll never understand women. I don't know if I, I mean, I've had a lot of women tell me I'll never understand men. I mean, isn't that the beauty and the power of this? Isn't this love means that I have to love the other? I have to love what I can't understand. I have to, I have to love, I have to see that there's an image of God in something that is so different than me. This, <clears throat> this, this love of God Meaning that we're called to be relational means this. It means that we live in a world where women are taught to believe that hypersexuality is the value of their body. You can say it's different. You can argue with me all you want to, but I can prove it. Turn on a television or go to a movie for three minutes. And what we're doing is we're teaching without even knowing that that it's how they look. It's what they have to offer. We, 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 we live in a world where, where boys, almost from the very moment they're born, are told, without even knowing they're being told, that their worth is to have power to dominate, to be able to win, to be able to win, to be able to have power to dominate. And when you live in a world that has hypersexuality, and you live in a world where it's called to dominate, no matter what we want to say, no matter how woke we are, whatever those words are, We live in a world that is set up for its own demise. But to see the image of God in each other, to see that we are made, male and female, equal in the eyes of God, to see that we are called to be in relationship with the other, means that Jesus was born not simply to reconcile us with himself, but to reconcile us with each other. We're called not just to be reconciled, but to be reconcilers. Jesus being born means that love is now called to be reconciled to be recreated. So he created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. <clears throat> Share this love. Children are not our possessions to be guarded. From the moment they are born, it is the call of the believer and the son of God for us to seek to give them away with an overflowing love. Every moment of their childhood should be lived in such a way where they see that there's something that's bigger that matters than just them. There's something that's bigger that matters than just their family. There are some things that their family does that doesn't make sense to the world, but we do because, not because we have a ruler, we have have traffic cop, because that's what it is to love. We live as kind families, not just having pity on people, but we live as kind families being eye to eye with those who are in need. And our children witness and see this. And this is not just about our biological children, my friends. Jesus didn't have any children, but he's talking about the love and the way that we lift and raise. This is why Jesus was born. So that love 
the love that comes from the Father and the Son even before the world was created. The love that a little two and a half year old sees without even knowing it, doesn't have a word for it about security and safety so that this world would know it. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have the wonderful and joyful privilege of responding to God's love for us. And so I'd encourage you now to, if you haven't gotten your connection card ready to do that, and I'd like for you to, um, to and also share your prayer concerns, just a reminder about that as well. And there is a basket near the center aisle. If you would take that, put your connection card in it, also your tithes and offerings, and pass that down your row. And then our, um, our greeters will collect the baskets on the outside aisle. As you're doing that, I'm going to be sharing some prayer concerns and praises as we, um, as we move toward the Lord's table. So I want to continue to pray for peace in our world and reconciliation in our country. Prayers for world leaders that they would be open to the wisdom of Jesus. Continued prayers for the refugees around the world and our partnership with Massanetta Springs as they, um, as they have welcomed refugees from Afghanistan and we're so excited to be a part of that, of welcoming the stranger. We have a praise for two grandsons. Jim and Martha White have a new grandson, Miles, and Diane and Steve Helveston have a new grandson, Emil. So, um, so excited for that, those families. We wanna to continue to pray for Chris McKinnon and Hing as their family um, figures out next steps for her and her care, and then praying for all of those who are experiencing deep loss. We received 111 prayer requests through our connection cards prayers for family and friends, prayers for health issues and requests for healing, um, seven specifically for those fighting cancer, prayers for loved ones to come to know Jesus, and prayers for guidance and discernment. Nothing defines family more than food, right? Meals. If you don't love grits and collard greens, you are not in the wood family. You know, Cheryl can make them both taste good enough that you won't even know what it is, but, but it's food, it's a meal, it's a table. That's why the value of family meals, please, please, please don't ever pass that. And so it's at a meal that after they've slept, they've had dinner, Jesus takes the bread, he breaks it, he blesses it, he gives it to them. He says, this is my body, it's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This do in remembrance. For as Apostle Paul tells us, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see what Jesus did? He didn't give us his favorite food. He gave us his body. He says, I want you to take this. I want it to be you. I want it to be you as you forgive, as you reconcile. I want it to be you as you share joy and laughter, as you play together, and as you cry together. I want to be with you. He prayed that night. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you that before the world was created, you were love. And that your love for the Son, the lover and the beloved is so overwhelming that it outpoured and it created this beautiful world. And we thank you for the beauty and the joy and the laughter and the play. We thank you that from the very beginning we walked with you and we cry out knowing that it was we who bent ourselves so that we saw only our image. And so we thank you that you came again as a son filled with love and light. And you offered this world your wholeness. 
And so we pray your spirit would come and transform these common and ordinary elements into a holy and sacramental purpose, just as you would do our lives. In the beautiful, holy, majestic name of our Savior Jesus, we pray, and it is in his name that we make bold and say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Time, I'd encourage you to find a communion station. So if you're sitting in the last um, three or four rows, there are tables right near the AV booth where you can go and pick up your elements. Um, and then if you're in the middle, go to the side walls and you'll find elements there. And if you're in the front couple rows, you can go to these two tables to my right, right and left and find your elements there. Once you get them, um, just go back to your seat and partake in the bread and in the cup. And then you are responsible for the leftovers. Let's continue to worship and enjoy God's gifts. By his stripes we are healed. By his nail he is as free. And by his blood we're washed clean. And now we have the victory. The power of sin is broken.
please, please, please be part of this Thanksgiving basket. Please also contribute so that we can provide turkeys. We've got 200 families that are identified that we believe are some of the neediest in our community. Please be the, the hands and the feet of our Savior Jesus. If you want to hold up anything at prayer, at the end of the service, we'll have a prayer team that'll be up here and they'll pray with you no matter what it is. Give them the gift and you get the privilege. And as you go out, I simply want to say this to you because I believe this is the core of the love of God. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, no matter what you're thinking right now, there is within you a memory that goes back to the very beginning of creation of what it is to be loved and valued and safe. Maybe one day you put a word play on it. Maybe another day you put the word security on it. But the word that the Father puts on it is love. That memory is what can be opened up into not only a beautiful life for you, but into the hope and promise of this world. Let us go and be that love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, be gracious to you.